Intelligent Transportation Systems Podcast. Welcome to the ITS Podcast. This is episode 35 for July 2016. Special issue about the Intelligent Vehicle Symposium 2016 that just has happened in Sweden a few days ago. We've been there, and we have prepared such a good selection of contents around it. We have one of its keynotes to speak about Volvo's vision of automotive driving, his Eric Klein, Senatonical Leader for Safety and Driver Support Technologies at Volvo Cars. He talked about Volvo's exciting project Autopilot that will be starting as soon as next year in Gothenburg, the city where IV 2016 was held. We also talked a little bit with Anna Nisonella, director of SAFER, host of the organization for IV 16, together with Chalmers University. It is a very interesting hub organization connecting together a big number of stakeholders on mobility safety. Very interesting stuff. Likewise, we also have comments from the IV general chair, parent chair, and also the IEEE ITS Society's president. So as you see, we have plenty of stuff for this episode. Let's start with our regular mini sections. Transportation in history and book review done by all volunteers, Mehran Shirazi and Professor Haluk Erem. Transportation in History by Mehran Shirazi, PhD candidate at Simon Fraser University, Canada. Magnetic Levitation Trains The idea of magnetic levitation for trains may seem to be futuristic and complicated. Can you imagine a train that actually floats about 10 centimeters in air and travels faster than 500 kilometers per hour? However, the idea of such a transportation system has been around for well over a century, but were deemed for a long time to be beyond our reach. The biggest problem faced by the high-speed rail system is friction, causing the bearings to wear out by overheating. To overcome this problem, several attempts have been made to levitate the train. Currently, two prototypes of the maglev trains are being tested one using electromagnetic suspension, EMS, and the other using electrodynamic suspension, EDS. The history of maglev trains started already in the beginning of the 20th century, when the American Robert Goddard and the French Emile Bachelet conceived the idea of frictionless trains. The scientists did not succeed with their idea, so the concept of frictionless trains lay dormant for about 60 years, until the Japanese and the German started to do research on the subject in 1970. After many years of experiments, the Japanese constructed their first test line, 7 kilometers, in 1975. In 1990, Japan constructed the Yamanashi Maglev EDS test line. This test line became 43 kilometers long and the first running test was in 1997. It took Germans 10 years to complete the construction of the first track model. In 1993, their speed record was 450 km per hour. In China, 2003, they finished the 30 km long German variant of EMS maglev train in Shanghai. The Britishers built a fully working commercial system connecting Birmingham Airport and local station a few hundred meters away which operated for about 10 years and was closed in the mid-90s due to shortage of spare parts. Looking to the future of the technology, a maglev connection between Shanghai and Beijing has been proposed covering a staggering 1300 km distance. It is predicted that the journey from Beijing to Shanghai would be quicker by train than by plane, as there would be no delays or baggage checks. The main problem of this kind of transportation is that a totally new infrastructure is required for the trains. Today, the maglev technology is no longer a dream, but an achievement. Recently, a Japanese test vehicle reached the unbelievable speed of 552 km per hour with passengers on board. It is clear that the future is very bright for maglev technology. The list of benefits of maglev goes on. Very low noise levels, 
30% more efficient than electric trains, can be powered by renewable electricity sources and therefore doesn't use scarce fossil fuels, speeds beyond compare with any other ground passenger vehicles, computer control system take away human error, no mechanical wear, the list goes on. It may have taken maglev over a century to get off the ground, but now that it has, it seems that nothing can get in its way. This is the book review section for the present issue of ITS podcast, reviewed by Dr. Halukaran, Fırat University, Elazığ, Turkey. The book title is Statistical and Econometric Methods for Transportation Data Analysis and consists of 530 pages, written by Simon Washington, Matthew Karleftis, and Fred Mannering. This book was produced by CRC in 2011. 17 chapters in the book are incorporated into four parts. Part 1 includes preliminaries of statistics, which hosts chapter 1 and 2. This section is a preparation work before the subsequent sections. Part 2 comprises chapters 3 to 10. It mentions about continuous dependent variable models. Chapter 3 handles linear regression, involved in residuals, indicator variables and associated statistical models. Chapter 4 elaborates the results of linear regression assumptions and solutions. Chapter 5 discusses simultaneous equation models with two or more interrelated dependent variables. Chapter 6, 7 and 8 refer to panel data analysis methods for similar observations on sampling units over time, time series methods, frequency domain time series analysis, including Fourier and wavelet analysis methods and models are embodied. Chapter 9 reviews the latent variable models when the dependent variable is not directly observable. Chapter 10 contains duration models via time data for survival, hazard and decay processes. Part 3 discusses count and descriptive dependent variable models. In Chapter 11, count models are elaborated when the data of interest are non-negative integers. Examples of such data include vehicles in a QE and the number of vehicle crashes per unit time. To model probabilities of binary outcomes, Chapter 12 discusses logistic regression. Discrete outcome and ordered probability models are given in Chapter 13 and 14. Discrete and continuous models are described in Chapter 15, such as the choice of which vehicle to drive and how far it will be driven. Finally, Part 4 contains random parameter models and Bayesian statistical modeling. The last two chapters discuss Bayesian statistical models, including Bayesian inference and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Existing chapters of the book are supported by relevant theory. A comprehensive overview and comments on the mathematical fundamentals, glossary, data tables and the research literature are given at the end of the book as individual appendices. Undergraduate students, researchers and professionals interested in statistical and econometric transportation data analysis will find this book a valuable reference. Very well, it is now time to dig into IB16. Dr. Marian Kabeshgar has done as brilliantly as usual the following interview. Enjoy it. Our guest today is Eric Kuling, Senior Technical Leader for Safety and Driver Support Technologies at Volvo Cars. Mr. Kuling has been keynote speaker at the Steel Worm 2016 IEEE Intelligent Vehicle Symposium, celebrated last June 19th to 22nd in Gothenburg, Sweden. Mr. Kuling delivered a very interesting talk about the breathtaking project Autopilot that Volvo is developing on autonomous driving. Eric, uh, could you please introduce yourself? Well, my name is uh, Eric Kuling, and I work as a technical specialist for active safety at Volvo Cars, and I'm also an adjunct professor in mechatronics at Chalmers University. And I have been working at Volvo Cars the last 15 years, uh, mainly on the development of collision avoidance technologies, but recently I've been entering the field of um, cell-driving cars, and this is really, really exciting. 
Thank you, Verik. Uh, could you please uh, give us an overview on what was your keynote uh, about? Uh, what's the philosophy that Volvo is implementing when approaching autonomous driving? Yeah, sure. Um, since a couple of years, we realized that the promise of self-driving cars is really attractive. Um, we think that self-driving cars can make traffic safer. It can make traffic more efficient. It can also reduce the fuel consumption. Um, and on top of that, it can allow people to do something else behind the steering wheel. So simplistically, you said it is very attractive to society, but it's also attractive to our customers. But at the same time, we realize that it's very challenging to bring a self-driving vehicle to the market. And when I say self-driving, I mean, in this case, a car that allows you to do something else behind the steering wheel. But in order to really develop the technology and make it reality, we have um, the target to build these vehicles and put them on the public road in par as part of our program called Drive Me. And our objective is to build 100 self-driving cars, lease them to ordinary customers, and learn how real people use self-driving cars in real traffic on real roads. That's our ambition. And by, by doing that, we will learn more about how self-driving cars will be used in the future. Uh, so, uh, Eric, uh, I think uh, Volvo is fighting uh, for making a difference in this exciting arena of uh, automotive industry developments on autonomous or automated driving. Uh, can you please explain how is Volvo's approach any different? Well, I think the, the aspects that are unique in the program that we are running is that we're not only developing the technology for the sake of technology, but we're really trying to understand the holistic perspective on self-driving. So we're looking at the technology with the developing cars and, and putting them in the hands of ordinary customers. But we're also looking at societal aspects of cell driving. So the safety aspects, the, the transportation aspects. Uh, we're looking at the human factors aspects. So how are people using a cell driving car? Do they understand how to use it? How do other road users react to cell driving car? What are the legal consequences, the product liability consequences? It's, it's a very, very complex environment we're operating in. And the unique aspect is that we try to do, try to address all of them at the same time. But realizing it's difficult to realize them all at the same time in all different countries, etc., um, made us to come to the decision that uh, we operate only on a limited set of roads in Gothenburg to start with. Uh, so, within, But within this limited scope, we will try to get a really holistic perspective. And once we've mastered that, we also know much better how to scale this to different locations. Uh, Eric, uh, how do users react to this technology? I assume you are testing it with uh, regular people out of the development team. Uh, so do they seem scared or do they fancy? You know, uh, there have been concerns on the cultural changes on passengers to embrace this technology. So uh, what's your experience on that? Well, most people that get into our self-driving cars, um, they are, I mean, it always surprises me to see how easily they accept it. And that's almost a challenge in itself because, um, I mean, you could illustrate it by this. Already today, we put cars on the market. The, the new Volvo V90, S90, they come equipped with something called pilot assist. The car accel accelerates, brakes, and steer itself, but the driver is always responsible and the driver has to supervise it. And already there, you see what the main challenge is. Drivers very easily accept the technology and they almost trust it too much. I mean, we have to we have to really go a long way to prepare our drivers for their responsibility and, and make them aware of their responsibility by requesting to put them the hands, their hands on the steering wheel. And that kind of illustrates that a lot of people have it, they find it very easily to trust a self-driving car. And when, when you put the people in cars with autopilot, uh, most of the people, I mean, sometimes you see people really excited that they finally can be in a self-driving car. But once they sit in a self-driving car, a lot of them almost are disappointed on how undramatic it is. Um, the car drives really smoothly, really comfortably, mm -hmm. and it's not dramatic at all. It just does what it uh, what you expect it to do. And that's, that's an interesting thing to see. Uh, but at the same time, I'm aware that the people that have not driven these self-driving cars, they may be skeptical to the technology. And that's fine. I mean, people 
have different preferences. That's the case today, and it will be the case tomorrow. <laughs> but as part of Drive Me, we will learn more. Um, we have not leased these these vehicles to people that use them in daily life. But once we can lease these cars to people that use them in daily life, we want to lease them to people that are sometimes early adopters, some people that are skeptical, some experienced drivers, some unexperienced drivers. And once we are at that point in time, we will much better understand how people are going to use a self-driving car. Uh, so, Eric, uh, from what uh, we understand, uh, Autopilot relies on internet access. Uh, according to the information in this project website, uh, if that connection breaks, it will quickly reset that connection. But the driver will have to take on control meanwhile. Uh, you know, uh, there is always that paradox we are seeing as automated driving is gradually gaining presence in our daily mobility. That is, uh, if drivers uh, lose training, because most of the time they will not be driving, will they keep the skills uh, to take on control in that eventual situation of a connectivity problem? Um. You had some, I mean, these, these are different questions. First of all, the question of uh, the internet connection. Mm -hmm. uh, it is right that our vehicles require a cloud connection. Uh, and this cloud connection is needed to make sure that the car, for example, gets the latest map data. But it's also needed to inform the vehicle of unusual situations. So, for example, if there's a snowstorm on its way in, or if there's a very particular traffic scenario, we want to make the autopilot feature unavailable through a cloud connection. If if the car would lose this connection, it will never be an unsafe situation. If it loses the connection, it will request the driver to take over. However, if the driver doesn't take over, the car will automatically stop. It will do a so-called minimal risk maneuver. It will try to slow down and park the car on the shoulder. So it's right that you need an internet connection, but the safety of the car and its occupants is not relying on this internet connection. And then your know, second part of the question was if drivers will lose uh, the driving capability if they would always sit in a self-driving car. And, and that is, of course, a risk, and we are aware of that risk. But I also think it, it will take time before we get to that point where it's a really practical problem. Um, the, the, the products that we're currently developing are cars that offer you both. Um, we currently do not have the ambition to replace the driver or the steering wheel. Uh, we think uh, it's very attractive to have a car that you can drive yourself. If the situation allows for that and it's fun to drive a car, you, you should be able to enjoy driving your car. But we also realize that there are many points in time where it's not fun to drive a car. Uh, when you commute to work, when you're stuck in a traffic jam, and in those cases, people can drive mm -hmm. uh, autonomously. So. And, 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 and the balance between the two, I'm sure, will change over time. You will be able to drive more and more and more autonomously. And there will be a point in time where drivers um, will maybe lose their skill. But um, maybe some of that can be, can be compensated through the driver support systems that we will develop in parallel. Um, but this is, this is really an unsolved problem. And, but it's, it's far in the future before it becomes a practical problem. Mm -hmm. About the future, uh, when uh, will we see this technology in the real world? Uh, what's your timeline to start uh, selling cars equipped with that levels of autonomy? Um, well, when we talk about levels of autonomy, you could say that uh, level two of autonomy, that is the, 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 what we call the pilot assist automation with driver supervision, that's on the market now. We sell that and we have a really good system there. Mm -hmm. um, our next step is that we will lease um, the autopilot cars, uh, 100 cars to some customers in Gothenburg, uh, actually also in, in a pilot in London, UK, and in China. Um, but that will be much more in the form of a field test. It's, it's leasing cars to real customers in order to learn. Um, and those tests will be ongoing, let's say, the rest of this decade. Uh, so the point in time, the earliest point in time where you can have a real product that will be in a showroom, in a Volvo showroom, I think will be on the other side of 2020. Uh, and how early, that depends very much on the results that we will get within the Drive Me program. Yes, true. Well, uh, that was all. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. We appreciate your participation and uh, I'm sure our listeners will enjoy it. Okay. Thank you very much. And just as a 
as information. If you want to know more about the Drive Me program, you can find it at www.volvocars.com slash autopilot. There will be a lot of information about what we do. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi again. We are recruiting volunteers for the ITS podcast. We know that a few of you wouldn't mind sharing some of your time, for example, preparing an interview or any other new content you may have in mind, recording some stuff, or helping out at our diverse backstage tasks if you are shyer than that. So don't be. Please send us an email at atsspodcast at gmail.com. Podcast at gmail.com. We will truly appreciate it. Now let's get back to our today's contents. Thank you. Let's hear now some comments from the event organizers. It's been a record-beating conference both in submitted papers and participation. We have Professor Janet Huabe, General Chair, and Professor Brendan Morris, Program Chair. Here they are. Okay, we are now with Jonas Huobadi, who's general chair of this uh, amazing intelligent vehicle symposium we are having now here in Gothenburg, Sweden. Well, congratulations. Uh, you, 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 I think you have put together a very interesting conference uh, and uh, again, a, a record beating conference. So can you please talk about it? How is it uh, unfolding? Well, today, now we have uh, still uh, the, the pre symposium day with workshops. So we have approximately half of all attendants already here attending workshops. And uh, tomorrow, uh, this evening, actually, we start really with a welcome reception. Uh, nice thing is that we have uh, an engagement from a lot of different uh, uh, directions. So the welcome reception is on behalf of the city. We have uh, a lot of uh, participating companies and organizations uh, locally and also internationally. So we are very happy to have more than 550 participants, which I think is a record. We have also been very successful with uh, sponsors. Uh, of course, that uh, increase and makes the job as a general share easier because it helps the economy. But even more is that the sponsors are engaged in this area and in our research. So they will um, make the conference more interesting with more activities. And we end with a day of demonstrations out at uh, Asta uh, Zero is uh, the, um, the name of the test site where we will have some uh, five, six organizations showing demos of auto uh, autonomous driving and active safety. Well, that's great. Well, I think you are raising the bar for the next uh, year's, uh, for the next uh, IB conference organizer. So thank you very much and congratulations again. Thank you too for coming here and uh, contributing to the to, con to the conference. Okay. Okay, we are now with uh, Brendan Morris. Uh, Professor Morris is uh, the program chair of this uh, successful intelligent vehicle symposium we are having here in Sweden this year. Uh, congratulations, Professor Morris. Can you give us uh, an overall impression on the program of this edition? Hi, Javi. Thanks for having me here. I uh, really appreciate the, the interview. Uh, this year's IV in Sweden, uh, it's been a great success. We were really happy with the, how the program turned out. We had over 400 submissions, which was a, a new record for IV to show the, the great growth that we've had in, in the community. Uh, in addition, it came from 37 different countries, and at the end of everything, we had over 200 uh, accepted papers coming from 29 different countries. So this was a, really a team effort, and we had a lot of uh, people working behind the scenes to generate good uh, proposals for, for papers and a lot of reviewers, and uh, everything looks really great so far. Oh, that's impressive. Uh, how about the topics? Uh, is there any new topic that you, that you can say it's becoming more popular in this conference? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, of course, autonomous vehicles have become very, very popular recently and in, in the public eye, uh, and then extensions of that to cooperative vehicles. But something that I was surprised to see a lot more was a lot of uh, human-machine interactions, and so working on the interface between autonomy and uh, human drivers. And in addition to that, also driver intentions. So these are two areas that really had a lot more uh, contributions than I thought I would see. 
Okay. Well, congratulations again, and thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, we also have some brief comments from Professor Daniel Seng, IEEE Intelligent Transportation Systems Society's president. Here it comes. We are with Daniel Seng, who is president of the ITS Society here in Gothenburg for the Intelligent Vehicle Symposium. Professor, can you please comment on it? How is this edition going from the society's perspective? Well, uh, as you know, the IV Symposium is one of the two flagship conferences the uh, IEEE ITS Society sponsors every year. Uh, in addition to a strong academic presence, IV has the unique tradition of reaching out to the industry and including as part of its technical program excitement generating vehicle and system demonstrations. The uh, society would like to congratulate the IV 2016 organizing team for putting together a very strong and exciting technical and social program. We thank all the organizers, sponsors, authors, reviewers, uh, demo teams, participants, and other volunteers to make IV 2016 a huge success. Uh-huh. How about the IDA Society? Is it healthy? How do you perceive it now that you are serving as a president? There is uh, no doubt that the golden age of doing IV and ITS research is now. Uh, I was just attending two days ago a top IEEE leadership gathering. IV and ITS are clearly among the very top techn technology areas among all IEEE engineering fields that have generated significant interests from the general public. The ITS and IV research also plays a major role in the majority of newest cross-cutting efforts from the IEEE in areas such as big data, smart cities, environment engineering, and 5G. Uh, we couldn't be more proud of what we have accomplished together uh, as a community. At the society level, there are lots of new initiatives. We have kick-started a variety of educational projects starting in this year, 2016. We have a new transactions on intelligent vehicles. Uh, if you are already an ITS Society member, we thank you for your contribution and encourage you to volunteer actively in our initiatives. If you are not yet a member, we urge you to consider to become one. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you. The ITS podcast is one of the super successful initiatives from our society. Thank you for your great service to the community and also your leadership. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. Goodbye. All right. Let's finish this special IV 2016 issue with a short interview to Anna Nisolinella. I have to admit it is quite refreshing having a bit of a not-so-academic view of our field. Here you have it, enjoy. We are now with Anna Nilsson Ille. She's director of SAFER, one of the major sponsors of the Intelligent Vehicle Symposium edition we are talking about today. Madame, can you please introduce yourself and your organization to our audience? What is the SAFER vision? Yes, uh, uh, SAFER is a, a 10 year old research center on traffic safety. Uh, and I am then the director of this since we started. And the vision for SAFER and the purpose is to do excellent interdisciplinary research, innovation and collaboration. And this is then to secure close to zero accidents and injuries in traffic. Uh, and by doing this together, the partners in SAFER, we also want to enable Sweden to hold the global leadership in traffic safety. And, and we think that traffic safety will be a key factor for implementing a sustainable, connected and automated traffic system. Excellent. I believe SAFER organization has a very tight relationship with uh, Chalmers University here in Gothenburg, but uh, not only with them, right? Uh, I think there are more than 30 partners from academia, industry and public organizations. Is it a, a bit of a hub? putting together uh, stakeholders in mobility and safety? Yes, absolutely. That was one of the, the basic ideas to set up SAFER, to create a hub for Swedish traffic safety research. Uh, and so we could 
we could uh, unite the uh, different stakeholders in Sweden that are interested in contributing to the goal uh, and also then to be someone that could interact with all the international hubs so that we can become a part of, of the bigger in the national system of, of uh, safety research. So, so we want to connect the stakeholders from society, academia and industry. So we get all the different perspectives that you need actually to address this question. Uh, but as you say, we have a special relationship with Chalmers University of Technology because Chalmers is the host uh, of SAFER. So, so, um, so that's where we start out, you could say. And then we have uh, uh, different uh, Swedish uh, academic partners like the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm and several others and the Research Institute and then uh, also the, the important industries, the OEMs, uh, Volvo, Volvo Cars uh, and the suppliers like Autoliv, but also insurance companies for instance. And then also equally important, the transport and, and traffic administration and uh, and uh, the region and the city of Gothenburg. So uh, we want to be an open an open arena, you could say. How about what you have seen here in IB16? Uh, what do you think are the more more exciting the most exciting topics boiling now in intelligent vehicles arena? Oh, that's a tough question. I, I think actually what I would like to say first of all is that I am impressed over the the broad competence that is present and the mix you see of cutting edge, cutting edge research and near to application. And I think that is really one of the key challenges that really intrigues me. The, that to solve the problems we are facing, you have to be able to, to combine cross disciplinary, a lot of different uh, uh, competences and different technologies and algorithms and the, uh, yeah, all the different aspects to, to really be able to um, set these systems into real life and, and also be able then to meet the high expectations we have on what we, we want to achieve. So I think but what I have listened to, uh, uh, well, all, all the things about the vision, how, how the, uh, the algorithms for interpreting and, uh, sensors and sensor fusion, I think that's uh, very, very interesting. And yeah. Well, that's a lot of things to mention, actually. So <laughs> I think I stopped there. Great. Very well. Uh, from your wide perspective, could you give, please give a final piece of advice to our colleagues, practitioners and students on intelligent transportation systems? I, th I think that um, what I think is important then is to have this uh, the open mind for uh, for new ideas and for collaboration, really to open up and, and and to share because we are building systems that will, in a sense, revolutionize uh, uh, society. It will absolutely revolutionize uh, the transport system, but also further, far further out from that. And uh, I think also that we, um, we also have to discuss uh, the pros and cons because, I mean, there, you can choose different ways. And I think that we have to find ways to ensure that we really move towards the good things we want to achieve with this, uh, with these technologies. Well, that's it. Thank you very much for your participation in this special issue of the ITS podcast and also for your commitment to our uh, flagship conference. So thank you. Thank you. It's been such a great experience to have this conference here, I must say. Right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Very well, this is the end of this special issue. Please send us your feedback. We are easier to read it. This podcast is sponsored by the IEEE Intelligent Transportation Systems Society. Website designed and managed by the Innovation Center for the Information Society at the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria in Spain. Soundtrack developed by Rubicon Audio Edition. Post-production and dissemination by the Institute of Cybernetics at the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. I'm Javier Sánchez Medina from the IEEE ITS Society. We'll be back soon bringing you again the cutting edge of science at the Intelligent Transportation Systems Podcast. Thanks for listening and drive safe.